The fifth act of economic resistance to Jim Crow and one manifestation of the new Negro was the so-called Great Migration of the Progressive Era. Although there were at least three waves of migration of black and white workers and families between 1910 and 1980 from the South to other regions and from the countryside to the city, we'll look at the first half of the first wave from 1910 to 1920. In that wave, working class blacks and whites migrated to escape poverty and for blacks to escape Jim Crow. Although white migrants outnumbered blacks, a larger percentage of the black population migrated. So we often think of the Great Migration as a race phenomenon, and it certainly was resistance to Jim Crow writ large. Much of the information for this part of the lecture comes from James Gregory book, The Southern Diaspora. Much of the information for this part of the lecture comes from James Gregory's book, The Southern Diaspora. This chart shows the number of Southern expatriates living in the North and West as counted by the census of the year shown, 1900 to 2000. The blue bars represent blacks, the orange bars represent whites, and the gray bars represent Hispanics, mostly Tejanos, according to Gregory. This is just an estimated headcount from Gregory crunching numbers in the census data set. He estimates on the low side. What we see here are numbers of people who reported that they had been born in the South, but were living in the North or West in the census year. Note the first three columns for 1900, 1910, and 1920, covering about half of our course time period, the second half of the course time period. Note the relative numbers of migrants by race and note their progression. Black migration growth from 1900 to 1910 increased 27%. From 1910 to 1920, it increased 42%, and across the entire 20 years, from 1900 to 1920, increased 57%. In those same years, white migration growth increased from 1900 to 1910 by 24%, 1910 to 1920 by 23%, and 1900 to 1920, that entire period, by 42%. That is less percentage-wise in every case than African-American. Migration scholars talk about push factors and pull factors in talking about why people migrated. As with every organizing principle, which we call theory, other scholars criticize push-pull as not being comprehensive enough. That's fair, but at least we can break the ice of our study by engaging in some theory that explains at least part of what went on. Here we look at two intertwined pushes, limited economic opportunity for both blacks and whites and political and social oppression that applied more to African Americans. Economic opportunities in the South had long been limited, with most workers finding themselves on farms or in extractive industries. Work on one didn't preclude work in any other sphere, for jobs then were not 40 hours per week, 50 plus weeks per year, and they weren't commitments that they had become over the course of the 20th century and that we recognize now. Sharecroppers went to town for work in the lay-by, and it was not unusual to move from one job to another seasonally. Sharecropping had become ossified well before the 20th century, and by 1910, it was almost a trap with few ways out. Cotton was king, but it was a perverse monarch. The market was glutted for decades, so prices fell. But the only cash crop in the South by design was cotton. So the more prices fell, the more cotton farmers planted. Then beginning in 1900, the boll weevil began its march from the Texas-Mexico border through the south, and by 1925, it had reached the Atlantic. This devastated cotton harvests and led to sharecropping failures in those areas that weren't able to diversify. Diversified agriculture demanded a financing system that loaned money on non-cotton crops and local industries that added value to those non-cotton crops. Few places converted, so few farms 
diversified. Extractive industries like the pine sap gatherers in this image, the first step in the turpentine industry, demanded less skill than it did brawn. Southern workers comprised a classic proletariat who didn't sell their skills as much as they sold their sweat. This pertained to other extractive industries too, like oil field work, coal and iron mining, and other types of naval store industries. There were some other industrial jobs, like in the Birmingham pig iron and pipe casting industry, as well as a small but growing textile industry, but only a few of those jobs were skilled and the racial divide was enforced by the workers themselves. There were a few professions available to the educated middle class, mostly lawyers, bankers, journalists, and physicians, as well as preachers. These positions were mostly filled by whites. In 1911, Pensacola, Florida, for example, of 32 physicians listed in the city directory, 28 were white and four were black. Furthermore, the long generation from 1890 to 1925 was the nadir, that is the low point of race relations in the South. This was the era of Jim Crow disfranchisement and segregation enforced by police, riot, and lynch law. Indeed, the racial caste system was as rigidly established as it had been in the antebellum South, but with a bitterly false patina of freedom overlaying it, and migrants, particularly blacks, wanted to get away from that. James Gregory notes that in this first wave of the Southern diaspora, middle-class whites were overrepresented. Commerce boomed out of major metropolitan areas and drew salesmen, financiers, investors, and other men on the make. Such people were looking for more action and excitement as well as greater opportunities. The pull for both black and white workers, even farm laborers and sharecroppers, was the growth of industrial employment with good wages and the reduction of overseas immigration that made internal laborers more necessary than ever. War production created over 3 million jobs in manufacturing and a, a, a other jobs that spun off in industries like transportation. During these 19 months of U.S. involvement in World War I from April of uh, 1917 to uh, November of 1918. These jobs paid high nominal wages, that is wage rates without regard to cost of living, that looked very attractive, especially to younger men who had seen little cash money in their lives. In addition to the war creating jobs, foreign immigration reduced to a dribble at the beginning of the war. In 1914, foreign immigration stood at 1.2 million people, but by 1918, only 110,000 arrived. In addition, once the war began, many established European migrants left the U.S. to enlist in their national armies. Newspapers advertised jobs throughout the country. This was particularly true of black newspapers like the Chicago Defender and the Pittsburgh Courier. The job situation was so critical that industry sent labor recruiters south to bring workers to the jobs. Recruiters often poached workers from industries and from off the farm. Some were formal employees of contracting employment agencies. Others were informal recruiters paid by the head. Recruiters found, recruited, and paid train fare for laborers to go to specific employers. Southerners hated the recruiters. That is, Southern whites hated the recruiters, largely out of fear that the recruiters would strip itinerant labor from the cotton harvest. Some cities like Montgomery, Alabama, passed ordinances requiring recruiters to get licenses to operate at cost up to $500. This was in addition to Alabama having a licensing fee of $500 and Montgomery County having a licensing fee of $500. The law may have applied equally, but the courts applied the law more selectively. In one case, the Montgomery Advertiser ran uh, stories about small-time, mostly black labor recruiters being hauled before Judge Gunter. Some were convicted of operating without a license and fined or jailed, but most were found not guilty after being held awaiting trial. That's some informal discouragement. I once read an article 
about two African Americans accused of recruiting without a license who got off after being held in jail. On the facing newspaper page was an advertisement for white women to migrate to South Carolina to sew overalls for an army contractor. Southern blacks were considered necessary labor, at least for part of the year, that is during harvest season, but Southern white women were considered excess labor and available for travel. Then springs up an enticement for both black workers and white women workers, traveling for work outside their home area or to cities providing greater freedom than they had previously enjoyed. Rural Americans had long considered cities to be pits of depravity, largely because the small community moral enforcement mechanisms didn't exist. Cities would make persons anonymous, basically. And quite frankly, it was easy to engage in vice even in small cities. But there were more cultural opportunities in cities, too. Regardless, the tight reins of family, community, and church didn't exist in town, at least not at first. For black Southerners, even though they did not blend in and become anonymous as readily as their white counterparts, the de jure shackles of Jim Crow and the long-simmering racial bigotry that underlay it were not quite as onerous in northern industrial cities. This is not to say that racial equality was available, but discrimination was less obvious or violent. Generally, we speak of the Great Migrations or the Southern Diaspora as a movement of Southerners to other areas of the country. But another Great Migration occurred from the countryside into Southern cities. The U.S. Census defines an urban place, a city, as having a population of 2,500 people. That's 2,500 people. And while the 1920 census was the first to record a majority of Americans living in cities, it was not until the, the 1950s that a majority of Southerners lived in cities too. In this discussion, we have to be mindful of the character differences between an urban place of 2,500 and a major cities of thousands. A small town's living patterns often mimic those of its surrounding countryside, as if the town was an extension of the rural area. Sure, town residents operate on city time and life patterns, but because so many rural folk visit town weekly or work in town sporadically, rural patterns of life still dominate. For example, the textile industry in the South was centered in small towns and was highly seasonal, so often workers left the farm during the lay-by to work in the mills or work part-time in the mills and part-time on the farm. This was an underpinning of the notorious vagrancy laws used to incarcerate poor whites and African Americans, mostly African Americans. These folks, almost all men, came to town when there was no farm work. They generally were day laborers, and if they didn't get work, they hung out. The law defined that as vagrancy, and many ended up with 30-day sentences where they were leased out by city and county judicial systems, or they ended up on chain gangs. A major city is much less dependent on the local rural population than a small town is. Major city rhythms are its own driven by commerce, administration, industry, transportation, finance, management, and labor. Economically, though major cities still need products from their neighbors, they are much more attuned to far-flung markets than our local farmers and small cities. Such cities developed in the South, particularly in the 20th century, Charlotte, Atlanta, Jacksonville, Tampa, Birmingham, Chattanooga, Memphis, New Orleans, Dallas, and Houston are some of the largest. Because they had year-round economies that didn't depend on the agricultural season, they provided economic and social opportunities that small towns and the countryside could not. In her book, The Other Great Migration, Professor Bernadette Pruitt uses her own family saga of migrating from the timberlands and, saw and sawmill towns of eastern Texas into Houston as a way to analyze rural to urban migration in the early 20th century. Now Houston, founded in 1836 by New York speculators, grew into an industrial giant because of three things that occurred from 1900 to 1902. The first of these things 
was the terrible hurricane that leveled Galveston in 1900, killing over 6,000 people and destroying the port. The second was the oil strike in Spindletop that, with other close-by oil strikes, made Houston the center of the Texas oil and subsequent refinery boom. The third event joined the other two. In 1902, the federal government promised to fund dredging the 52-mile channel from the coast to Houston so ocean-going ships could dock there in Houston. Pruitt documents both the patterns of immigration of rural blacks from East Texas and Western Louisiana into Houston, notes the predominance of chain migration, which was common to all eras of extensive migration, and describes the social and economic infrastructure these migrants built to sustain their vision of prosperity in Jim Crow Houston. Pruitt estimates that 32,000 blacks migrated to Houston from the surrounding area from 1900 to 1941, well outside of our uh, discussion, in four waves. 7,500 job seekers came from 1900 to 1914, with another 1,000 during World War I. So in our period, 8,500 uh, migrants showed up in Houston. The boom times in the 1920s brought a third wave of 15,000, and another 9,000 came during the 1930s, mostly between 1935 and 40, seeking jobs and relief that didn't exist in the surrounding countryside. World War II accelerated rural to urban immigration and began a marked decline in the rural population. Where early migrants worked at service and light industrial jobs, World War II led to the expansion and availability of heavy industry and much better paid jobs. Black migrants into Jim Crow Southern cities crafted often vibrant segregated societies with their own businesses, financial structures, and social hierarchy. Black entrepreneurs built uh, black businesses, penny and dime banks increased capital, black workers leveraged industrial need and federal government policies into better employment, and a black middle class led by preachers, teachers, and business people provided services that were not usually available to African Americans.